you are live. All right, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. This is the East Bay Regional Park District Natural and Cultural Resources Committee. And we are meeting um, via Zoom at December, on December 9th, 2020, beginning uh, just after 1230. So I'm gonna ask uh, Yoka Yamamoto to do the roll call, please. We're not hearing you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Hearing. Roll call. <laughs> okay. Sorry, roll call, community chair lane. Here. Director Coffey. Here. Director Eccles. Here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, with us today is Assistant General Manager um, Kelchner and um, Chief of Stewardship Matt Grawl and a number of other uh, staff members who are uh, will be participating in, in the um, meeting. Uh, today's board meeting is held in accordance with Governor Newsom, Newsom's executive order allowing for board members to participate in standing committee meetings remotely. We are also providing live audio and video streaming and have provided the public with the opportunity to email or call in prior to the meeting uh, for public comment. All information regarding participation in this meeting can be found on the agenda at uh, the district website ebparks.org. So today we have several items on the agenda and after each presentation, we will take public comment through the Zoom platform on that item. And so uh, you should communicate with the committee secretary if you are interested in speaking on this item and you'll be recognized to speak during that public comment time. So do any of the committee members have any questions on these procedures? Okay, not seeing any. Um, we do have public uh, comment at the end of the meeting, and I know we have um, some messages that were received via email and some people who want to speak directly to the board or to the committee, and that will be scheduled at the end of our agenda. So we'll begin with our first agenda item, which is the stewardship post-fire response to the 2020 Deer and SCU Lightning Complex fires. And we're going to have Wildland Vegetation Program Manager Dina Robertson and Wildlife Biologist Tammy Lim talk to us. All right, please proceed. Okay, can everyone see the presentation? Yes, I can see it. Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon, members of the board. I'm very grateful uh, to be here to talk to you about the stewardship department's efforts um, on the 2020 wildfires that impacted district lands. So I'm Dina Robertson, the Wildland Program Vegetation Manager. I'll be presenting along with, we added one person, Doug Bell, our wildlife program manager, and Tammy Lim, wildlife biologist too. We're gonna cover uh, the fire suppression repairs, post-fire assessment, and planning for the future of fire during this presentation. This is an overview map of the SCU lightning complex, the ones that impacted, the fires that impacted district lands. On the right hand side, you can see the very large, uh, the main SEU lightning complex fire that impacted the Ohlone and Mission Peak. And on the left, the fires uh, that are also known as the Deer Zone fires that impacted Round Valley and Morgan Territory. 
So they're called the Santa Clara Unit Lightning Fires. It's exactly how it sounds. The fires were ignited by lightning strikes in 2020. I read something around 14,000 lightning strikes hit uh, California and ignited about 870 fires. So here are some stats, uh, acreage of land burned uh, by park. So the, the column on the right, these, these, these fires were much larger than just the acreage that impacted park district lands. So the total fire sizes are on the right and then the acreage impacted um, East Bay Park lands on the left. So you can see the Ohlone was uh, about 4,500 acres. So that's the largest acreage impacted for parks. But the total fire size of that one was 396,000 acres. And all the way down to the bottom, I'm going backwards, but Mission Peak, four acres impacted. The total si fire size was 5,000, and much of that burned um, on SFPC lands or on adjoining lands. Adjoining lands. Okay, so right around the times the fire uh, were still burning, they were still burning in Ohlone, and stewardship department said, what are we gonna do? Let's put our heads together, uh, and, and what do we wanna do in response to these fires? So we quickly got together with our fire department, Chief Tiley, and had a conversation to talk about what should we do? You know, what, are, what, are, what do we usually do in circumstances like this? And um, since it's such a, a novel event, um, we kind of had to, to come up with this uh, in the new. So we started with coordination meetings. Uh, we had a stewardship, a focus group with stewardship uh, staff. I think there are you know, around 10 of us that we met weekly. Um, and then we also have interdepartmental meetings that Chief Grawl set up. And that included um, ops and stewardship, fire, our fire department, ASD staff, finance, and, and the air support unit. We also coordinated with our East Bay Stewardship Network partners, uh, in particular with San Francisco PUC and the Contra Costa Water District. The East Bay Stewardship Network uh, was started and put together by Becky Tudin in stewardship. Uh, it's been happening for a couple of years now. We uh, have been planning um, talking about ecological goals together on a landscape scale. So we already had a nice uh, partnership uh, in place with them. So it was easy to pick up the phone and get on Zoom and start coordinating around post-fire efforts. We also coordinated with CAL FIRE for the fire suppression repairs and Doug Bell, who will be talking about this later, was our liaison, district liaison with CAL FIRE. We also conducted site visits to assess impacts to cattle infrastructure to identify resources at risk. We were able to use the, the district helicopter to go out a few times to help with that effort. And we also did natural resource monitoring, just the initial post-fire monitoring for vegetation, wildlife, and ponds. So we've already to date put in about 500 hours of stewardship time in these efforts. Okay, this is an, this, we'll spend a little time on this slide. So what, how, what did this fire do in the landscape? That was our big question. And what we did find uh, was that the fire severity was quite low and moderate. So there were a few areas that were high severity uh, on our lands and one was in Ohlone and another was at Morgan Territory. So the picture on the left, you can see that one of the more high intensity plot areas that burned at Morgan Territory. And that was mainly chaparral with some blue oaks as well. And in the middle, we have a, an image uh, and from, from the air of Ohlone. And this was very typical of what we saw out there. You can see um, that the fire did not take out a lot of the old or big woody vegetation, the trees. It really was mainly a ground fire. So it burned up the finer fuels and some, and some shrubs as well. So, uh, and then the right also is another example of that in Ohlone. So the one on the left of Morgan Territory looks quote unquote bad. You think, oh gosh, all the vegetation has burned. But this community that burned is fire adapted. So uh, we already see plants coming back um, as of last month. They're, they're out there re-sprouting. There's a lot of plants in this community that rely on fire in order to come back and regenerate. And then there's plants that we wouldn't see if it hadn't burned. There are fire followers. So you'll get a chance to see those as well. So these fires occurred primarily in rain in uh, rangelands that are actively grazed. So the fine fuels were at a lower level than they could have been if we didn't have active grazing in those areas. There were backfires lit by Cal Fire 
that also contributed to lowering the fire intensity. And if you're interested in looking more closely at the fire severity, there is an, uh, there's a report called the work done by Cal Fire. It's the Watershed Emergency Response Team Evaluation, uh, which is done to identify post-fire hazards, but has some nice burn severity maps in there as well if you're interested. So next I'm gonna turn this over to Doug Bell to talk about Cal Fire suppression repairs. Doug? Welcome, Doug. Yes, thank you very much. I'm trying to find my camera. Um, there we go. Sorry for the delays. Um, can I go back one slide, please? Thank you. Um, so thank you, Dina. I'm um, sorry about the delay here. Uh, good afternoon, Committee Chair Lane and fellow directors Coffee and Nichols. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you today about fire suppression repair. I'll briefly describe, you know, what it is, um, how it works, and provide a few examples. Um, so if you look at the picture on the right here, um, you can see essentially a, a very pink fire retardant line going up slope through the grasslands and immediately adjacent to it is uh, bare dirt. That is a dozer line uh, that was cut um, on the perimeter of the fire to help contain it. And of course, on the right side is the blackened grassland from, from the fire itself. So um, fire suppression repair is actually trying to fix the things that um, Cal Fire uh, you know, damaged in the course of fighting that fire. So you can imagine um, you know, with, the, with the impact of, of hundreds of personnel and hundreds of heavy equipment all being brought to bear on, on, a, on a given fire that, it, that, that can cause a lot of impacts to the landscape and, and uh, other features. Um, so essentially what suppression repair attempts to do is, is fix those impacts. And so dozer lines are an important um, landscape feature. You know, they would, they would uh, start uh, working to smooth those out, as well as to um, put in erosion controls. Other features that they try to repair are any archaeological sites that uh, may have been damaged in the course of firefighting, and of course, roads and infrastructure, such as culverts, um, and then a lot of vegetation, which is left um, lying about or is uh, damaged through the suppression repair efforts um, also uh, gets taken care of. And then finally, um, things like gates and fence lines that they may have cut through or knocked down um, to access fire sites um, are, re are repaired as well. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? So uh, as, as a case in point, um, this requires, as you can imagine, a, a, a number of teams and both from CAL FIRE itself as well as from the district uh, were involved in, in the overall effort. Um, CAL FIRE assembled a team consisting of an incident commander. Uh, they assembled archaeologists and foresters, uh, GIS specialists, heavy equipment operators to bring the equipment in. Other, in other words, dozers and graders and masticators to take care of uh, the cleanup operations, as well as large numbers of you know, hand and fire crews. And, and basically, um, suppression repair begins as soon as the smoke is cleared. Uh, a lot of organization went into this while the fire was ongoing, so starting in August. Um, and then um, as soon as the situation was under control, these crews mobilized. Uh, the district also participated in this in a major way through our own fire department, also affecting suppression repairs, um, as well as our air support unit, um, GIS services, and park operations. Next slide, please. So, and um, our effort as, as liaison between all of those teams um, took a number of various forms. And so for instance, in the picture in the upper left, you see a picture of our air support unit, the helicopter. Um, we coordinated with CAL FIRE to, to make sure that uh, fire chiefs and incident commanders were able to get up in the air and survey and orient to the um, larger repair efforts. Um, this is important on a regular basis as well to um, get people out into the landscape because you can imagine through the whole fall, we had a lot of um, active fires in California. And so crews were constantly changing out. So um, it was almost on a weekly basis that we were um, mobilizing both ground 
forces and whatnot to get get the commanders out there. Uh, the picture on the right um, was one of the daily briefings, um, again, through September, October, November, and actually all the way up through the end of December, fire suppression repair crews from CAL FIRE will be active. And so we would meet um, every morning out at Del Val to go over the, the work plans. Um, and then I would take that information and supply it to park operations so that they would have a better idea of any issues um, such as access or other important items um, that, would be, that would be involved in this overall effort. And then I'd like to call your attention to the lower left picture um, as an example of some of the repairs that the district itself affected. That's a picture of a culvert on Bluff Road out in Sinol. And actually there is no culvert there. The hole you see is the spot that used to contain the culvert. It was entirely vaporized in the fire. So it's basically just dirt holding up the road right there. Um, Cal Fire, um, in those instances where um, they couldn't have a team go in right away to fix that, um, they supplied the materials um, or allowed us to purchase the materials. And then our park operations um, went and fixed that site. And another important point about all of this is we are operating under the emergency authorization permits of CAL FIRE. That is, in other words, if we were to go out and get our own, say, stream bed and alteration agreement, it would take you know months of the regulatory process to get that approval. But given the fact that this is an ongoing emergency, we could operate under those permits and, re and um, supply the reporting requirements accordingly. Um, I'd just like to give a special thanks to Ed Ori, the Cal Fire Incident Commander. He's um, He's been on site um, since August and um, with, it's really a pleasure to work with him. Uh, next slide, please. And I'd just like to show you one, one sort of before and after result of CAL FIRE suppression repair. On the left, this is up in the Ohlone Wilderness along the Ohlone Trail. You can see the massive amounts of vegetation that were cut. Um, the road was pretty rutted as well. You can't see that because we're standing on it, the vehicles are on it. But on the right is the result of after fire suppression repair has gone through. You can see that the vegetation has been cleared, masticated, chipped, um, and the road has been burned out. So it's a great example of, of um, one of the results of the fire suppression repair. So with that, um, I conclude my part of the talk. I thank you for your attention and I will turn it back over to Dina. Okay, for the next part of this presentation, uh, I'll be talking to you about impacts to grazing operations and infrastructure, monitoring for post fire recovery for vegetation ponds and wildlife, and monitoring for recovery from dozer lines, fire retardant and erosion, and also a little bit more about cross-boundary collaboration. So we found that six grazing tenants were impacted at six parks. Um, there were several parks where there were no cattle present during the fires because they're seasonally grazed, and so the cattle had already been removed from the parks. After talking with the tenants, we found there was a low livestock mortality. I heard that there were two calves that died, um, probable due to stress from the fires. Several of the, of the tenants had evacuated by livestock before the fire crews even arrived. You know, this was the case for Ohlone, where many, many head of cattle were moved out and not, uh, they, did, they weren't lost to the fire. Infrastructure, perimeter and interior fencing uh, were damaged. The estimates of the repairs are as high as 900,000 for replacing fences and gates. Water infrastructure uh, in the fire zone were mostly spared. So that, that's a positive for the infrastructure. Very little of that was impacted. Let's talk about vegetation, post-fire assessment. So we uh, developed, our, our consultant, Nomad Ecology, developed a monitoring protocol to aid us in doing post-fire recovery monitoring. Uh, we also worked in collaboration with SFPUC staff. They have adjoining lands that also burned in the Alameda Creek watershed. So we got together and talked about coming up with a protocol that we could both, we could all use and implement. So that would make our data set much larger and more useful and applicable. We also work with Contra Costa Water Districts. We were able to uh, access their lands with their permission to pick up some more data plots that we wouldn't have otherwise had if we only did it on district land. 
So we sampled uh, some different vegetation types, oak woodlands, both sedulous and evergreen, and chaparral, sagebrush scrub, and real or going to be doing grasslands as well. Uh, we definitely wanted to include these fire dependent communities, uh, the chaparral in particular and the sagebrush scrub. We will be looking for special status plants in the spring next year. Some of the information uh, that we want to glean from this, this data set is uh, non-native invasive plants. I want to make sure that if they come in and uh, start to be of a level of concern or if they're new non-native invasive plants, we want to be able to treat those or if we see erosion or other um, things of concerns in the areas that burned, we'd be able to capture that. And we've only done the post-fire assessment, so we've gone out just to capture that information that disappears very quickly from the landscape, such as the amount of ash or the depth of ash and things like that. So we've done the first round, there's a lot more to do on 2021. The picture on the right is uh, at Oregon Territory of a sh uh, chaparral patch that burned uh, very high intensity. But um, right near that same plot, you can see that the chemise is already re-sprouting in that picture in the middle. And just a note too, these, we're going to be monitoring both burned and unburned plots. But for now, we've only done the burned plots and next year will be the unburned. Okay, I am gonna turn it over now to Tammy Lim to carry us through talking about wildlife. Good afternoon, all, and thanks, Dina. Um, everybody can hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. Great. Um, I'll jump right into what we're doing to track wildlife response to post-fire recovery. Um, about half of the ponds, um, we've got about 80 in the Sunol Ohlone area, were either in or near the SEU burn perimeter. These ponds are pretty important. They provide both water for cattle and also breeding habitat for rare amphibians and reptiles. And because they're such an important resource, uh, we're planning to follow six of them in the Ohlone wilderness for the next year. We're planning on comparing pond conditions in both burned and unburned areas and track the water quality and general pond conditions before and after the rainy season. Previous research <clears throat> in similar burned areas has shown that excessive sedimentation can be an issue as well as increases in nitrates and phosphorus. Phosphorus in particular is uh, present in fire retardants, seen here in the photo as a pink strip. Um, they did, Cal Fire did try to attempt to avoid ponds when distributing fire retardant. Um, and phosphorus is also occurring naturally in sediments. Fortunately, most of the ponds that were affected like this one were surrounded by grasslands and those habitats burn relatively lightly as Dean has mentioned. So we anticipate that most ponds won't be too adversely affected by the disturbance. Next slide, please. And then in late winter or early spring 2021, we'll initiate the first of three follow-up surveys to track California red-legged frogs, like the one shown here, California tiger salamanders, and western pond turtles. The frog and salamander are listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act, and the pond turtle is a California state species of special concern. Next slide, please. In addition to ponds, we'll study some terrestrial species. Kristen Van Dam, our resource analyst too, oversees a conservation property established for Alameda whip snake in the Sonoma Regional Wilderness. This area was set aside as mitigation for activities for our fuels management program. And along with Amanda Murphy, our consultant and whip snake expert, we've captured 16 whip snakes here in the past three years. This year, the conservation property burned almost entirely. And you can see this below. Some areas of chaparral, like the sage shown here to the left of this fence, burned at high intensity and it appears burned completely. However, this is actually a really unique opportunity to track whip snakes pre and post fire. So this spring we're planning on reestablishing the drift fences and cover boards to document if whip snakes are still present on the landscape. Mandy Murphy does note that coastal sage scrub and whip snakes evolved with fire for millions of years. So we're really optimistic that many of these threatened snakes likely survive this fire and will return to the burn area as scrub regenerates. Next slide. Um, to additionally track terrestrial wildlife, we are working with Dr. Susan Townsend. She's a mammologist and camera trapping expert to implement post-fire monitoring for terrestrial wildlife at 
Round Valley, Morgan Territory, and in the Los Vaqueros watershed. To date, we've established 40 camera stations, 20 in burned areas, and 20 in unburned regions. At each of these stations, we're gonna have a camera shown here on the photo on the left um, that, that are set to capture mammal activity. And then we'll add um, audio moths. These are um, small auditory loggers programmed to record bird calls and other sounds for brief periods daily. And then finally, we'll have bat detectors, which are um, also, also passive recorders for, to record high frequency bat, bat calls. And with this project, we'll actually be trying out some new tools, including a centralized database in AI, AI that's been developed by international conservation groups. A screenshot from Wildlife Insights shown on the right, um, this database catalogs and stores camera trapping data from around the world. Next slide, please. And then um, this map and photo, the photo we were able to take during one of our helicopter flights, show the same general region on the western side of the Los Vaqueros Reservoir, where it meets Morgan Territory at the top of the ridge. As Dina mentioned, we've coordinated with Contra Costa Water District, they're one of our network partners, to extend our efforts to cover portions of their lands. On the map to your right, you can see some small white dots with alphanumeric codes. These dots indicate where the camera stations are, and we were able, with our collaboration with Contra Costa Water, to sample across the landscape. The animals we're studying don't follow jurisdictional boundaries, so it was great to be able to sample across property lines. We're hoping the study will allow us to understand recent fires impacts to wildlife and will provide critical data on species presence, distribution, diversity, and abundance, ultimately informing adaptive manage management decisions and preparing us to manage for fire in the future. Additionally, the methods we're using are consistent with other monitoring projects, including a similar study in the Ohlone and efforts by researchers at UC Berkeley, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Peninsula Open Space Trust, and others. And with that, uh, thank you, and I'll hand, hand it back to Dina. Thank you, Kim. Just a few more slides to go. Okay, natural resource management challenge. So there are several challenges, as I'm sure you're familiar with, to managing this landscape of the park district. Changing climate is top of the list. We're having increasing droughts, Rain events are coming in shorter, more intense events. They're becoming, um, our fires are becoming more frequent and more intense. We have a very complicated regulatory requirements uh, network for our lands. Um, we're also getting new lands uh, often and those new lands often come with regu new regulatory requirements we have to meet. The district lands and the surrounding lands are highly managed and they require a large commitment of resources to do so. And when I say management, I mean things like the grazing program, treatment of invasive plants, using fire to manage the landscape. We have a relatively small but mighty team of 22 FTEs to, to cover uh, the 125,000 acres that we have currently to manage. Um, and we are more reactive and we'd like to be more proactive going forward. The other thing I wanted to mention is that very little of the district, only 3,000 of this 125,000 acres are under an operating fuels management plan that is permitted. So what are some of the solutions to these challenges? Some of the groundwork that will be extremely helpful is coming up with uh, a geospatial vegetation map for the district or even to go further the East Bay. There are fine scale existing vegetation maps that have been newly created for most of the San Francisco Bay Area with the ex exception of the East Bay. On the right is just an example of what I'm talking about with this fine scale vegetation map. So the colors are different kind of vegetation communities. On that. So our veg maps that we have, we have some, but they're very old, they're out of date, things change quickly um, as far as even what you see on the ground, as far as the vegetation. Um, 
and they really are not uh, effective in helping us manage and uh, looking for trends over time and change that are happening. Uh, from a vegetation map, you can also uh, derive a wildlife risk, but that should say wildfire risk model. Uh, part of the groundwork is continuing on with the ecological health assessment that Becky Tubin is leading and has been for the last uh, year or two. And that's in coordination with the Space Stewardship Network that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the long term monitoring that we've, that Becky, I'm sorry, that uh, Tammy and I had spoke about with wildlife and vegetation, it's just getting started. So we need to build that data set and keep it going. Uh, and we also uh, need to identify funding and staffing needs to meet some of these goals and being more proactive with management. Fuels and vegetation management plan. This is a little bigger, long, longer term, but you know, coming up with a district or a regional vegetation man management plan would be very, very helpful. Um, for, for managing the landscape. Uh, we need to clarify our goals and build that toolbox for managing um, natural resources. So that would include prescribed and cultural burns, um, as well as other ways of managing the landscape. So that's, that's gonna be it, but I wanna thank uh, the stewardship staff that really put their heads together for this and worked really hard. I, you know, I'm new to the district. I've been here uh, just about a year and I'm thoroughly impressed by the enthusiasm of stewardship staff to just come together and jump on something and rise to the challenge of like, let's do this. And it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. I've, I've actually enjoyed it. So it's a good opportunity to, to collaborate. Uh, I also wanted to thank our fire department. Uh, Chief Tiley was really great um, helping encourage us and support us in these efforts that we talked about uh, and, and Mike Matheson as well. And for questions later, if we have time, um, Allison Wolf, our uh, range one specialist is present and as well as Mike Matheson. And that's it. Should I stop sharing my screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, quite, a, quite a lot of information in this report and um, very interesting indeed. So um, Colin or Elizabeth, do you have any uh, questions or comments you'd like to make at this time? No, no questions. I just wanted to uh, thank the uh, presenters for doing uh, a wonderful job at the presentation. And it reflects a really good work that's going on uh, within the district to uh, uh, get some, some feedback from nature on, on uh, these events and how to uh, manage for the future. Yeah, and similarly, I, I really appreciate the report and the information and it, it's good to look forward and how we can heal the land but also you know what we can do um going forward and i appreciate the collaboration both within the district and also with with cal fire so great work thank you yeah and i too uh, i'm really glad that you partnered with contra costa water district in that um round valley morgan territory area because looking at that map we can see how much of the uh, water district land burned. And I do have a question about that land and about Morgan territory in particular, because um, I understand that some of those e enormous manzanita um, bushes or trees were really burnt. And so did you, were you able to have any additional information about the manzanita there? I think that the, thank you for that question, Dr. Lane. Uh, I think that the, the, the plots that we put out there will help us better answer uh, what the, that plant community response to fire will be. We're, we're pretty encouraged just by seeing what's already coming up out there in the areas where the manzanita uh, was burned. And in many cases they look dead, but they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily dead. 
you know, we did our best, like, you know, if we could see a sprout, we could say it was alive, but really it's going to be the um, next year's monitoring where we'll be able to see uh, what the mortality was. And I also think we're going to see plants that are really interesting that need fire, the like fire followers to even germinate and come out. So I think that will be a really interesting part of that particular plant community. Yeah, so I know that is the case. Um, I would, you know, I'd appreciate getting more information on the man's feet. Um, and then I had a few other questions. Are, uh, Christina, did you have something on the manzanita? No, no, on fire in general, but go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the ponds that you are addressing, are those all ponds that are um, drainage ponds? They're not getting water from pipes? They, uh, the, the livestock ponds are primarily fed by springs and seeps. Okay. And those, the water's captured in the, in the ponds. All right. And then, um, um, so when you were, um, when you were talking about studying, um, uh, various, uh, wildlife, including the bats and others, in the area that you're studying, do we have any basic base information on that or will your studies be the initial information? And I'm a different wildlife. Thanks, Director Antlin. Yeah, um, we do have some baseline data. Um, a lot of it, especially from places like Round Valley, some of it is um, pretty old, in some cases decades old. So this will give us some new information on um, presence of mammals and also birds. So we're looking forward to having a revised data set in that area. Okay. And then uh, you were talking about the, the importance of not being um, reactive and proactive. So what exactly were you talking about? Uh, so um, some of the tools that help us to uh, manage fire on the landscape, um, you know, we're going to have another fire for sure at some point. And um, there are areas where we could do fuels, uh, treatments of vegetation, fuels management that could help with um, making sure we don't get the kind of fire that we don't want on the landscape next time. I mean, we, I think we did pretty good this year, which was, that's positive. But if we have something like a vegetation map, a space layer, from that you can derive information about like, okay, well, here's where we have the hottest, hottest fire. And this is the kind of vegetation that we have there. So we could do a fuels treatment in those areas to, um, to, to, to better manage fire. But that wouldn't just be in Ohlone, of course, this would be on all district lands. Yeah. So that's the one example. Sounds like a, a big project. Yes, very doable though. Yeah. So I did have a chance to hear from Chris uh, Lyle, who is the supervisor for Round Valley, and um, want to say how um, grateful I am that people stepped up so quickly to um, replace piping there and to address the, I think, small trails crew uh, was addressing the fencing all that went around the backpack camp in that location. So I'm, I'm looking forward to um, the post-fire beauties, because right now it looks pretty burned over. So um, anyway, I am, thank you very much for it. And um, Ms. Skelter, did you want to add something? Yeah, um, thank you, Director Lane, Christina Kelchner. Uh, I just wanted to remind the board how important this um, data gathering is for our future funding opportunities. FEMA and other organizations that provide funding for fire tend to think in terms of structures lost when we talk about fire recovery. Um, but so it's important that we have data and are able to educate FEMA and others about grazing infrastructure, um, actual uh, animals that we lose through smoke inhalation, um, and the importance of the expense of um, keeping that, um, repairing that infrastructure. So. And it's also, as you're hearing from our wonderful biologists and experts, it's such an opportunity um, when we had so many acres burned to really learn about um, the impact of the fire, beneficial and negative, 
uh, on the landscape. So uh, these are big projects, but um, they also are very important so that we have the data because it will help us with the funding um, efforts going forward and also just in our uh, understanding of how to manage, best manage these landscapes. And I think prescribed burns is something that we're all going to be hearing a lot more about um, as a tool that um, we need to be looking at to manage these landscapes. And uh, this data will all help to do that. And I also appreciate um, our staff, the close coordination with CCWB, with SM, SFPUC, SPAMUD, other large landowners uh, who are facing the same issues we are so that we can coordinate the efforts in the resource management. Yeah, okay, well, well, thank you. I think one of the things we've seen over with various disasters, uh, fires, wind, floods, um, that the district has gotten better and better at documenting um, what has happened and when it has happened for just that reason. Because when you go to an agency like FEMA, you just don't go with general comments they really want specifics if you're going to be able to get funds to repair. So, all right, I, I really appreciate this. Okay, so we'll turn then to our next item, which is, we were, no. <laughs> Uh, harmful algal bloom remediation and management. And we're going to hear from um, Ecological Services Manager Becky Tuden, Water Management Supervisor Hal McLean, and Fisheries Biologist Ed Culver. Hello and welcome. I'm now reading yeah. the agenda on my smartphone, which I've never done before. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm I'm turning techie. All right, go ahead. Good afternoon, Director Lane, members of the committee. I'm Becky Tudin, uh, Environmental Services Manager. I'm very happy to be here uh, to talk about our harmful algal bloom program. I know we've given you a lot of regular updates, but um, we've done a lot in this last year, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you, as along with Hal McLean and Ed Culver. Uh, next slide. So just to let you know what we'll be talking about, I'm gonna just do a quick review on cyanobacteria. As you know, that's um, the proper term, but it's also referred to uh, more informally as blue-green algae. Uh, I'll give you an update on our overall management program, and then we'll hear more specifically about our remediation efforts for the HABs at Lake Temescal and Lake Anza. Next slide. Uh, and I just want to uh, give acknowledgments to um, the entire park district. Uh, you know, it started out just being a very small program with our, our water management unit, but it quickly expanded. And as we've gone, gotten more into looking at the, the monitoring and the communication on the HABs and the communication on the risks, we've worked with park operations, um, interpretive staff and public affairs. And then as we've moved into remediation, we've also worked closely with design and construction and MAST. Uh, next slide. So uh, I just want to clarify that there are different types of algae. Um, we call uh, cyanobacteria, also blue-green algae, and also harmful algal blooms. But there's also filamentous algae, which is also an algae but does not have the health risks or the toxins. So uh, um, they're the cyanobacteria that we're looking at most, we get most often microcystin and um, when the toxins are present, they can have um, skin, nerve, and liver effects, and you can get those effects either from ingestion or just incidental contact. Um, as we've seen in the district, dogs are at greater risk uh, because typically they're submerged in the water and they often lick um, the algae off their fur. Uh, there's also uh, information that uh, cyanobacteria is affecting um, other animals in nature, including otters and um, and some fish. Fortunately, in, in our reservoirs, we've done site-specific testing for the last five years, and we've determined that we are not bioaccumulating toxins in the edible portions of our fish. So that's good news. Um, next slide. 
So just a little bit on cyanobacteria, it's actually a very remarkable creature. It's found worldwide. It's one of the oldest known organisms. It has some unique traits. It can go up and down in the photic zone. It can actually um, produce its own energy through photosynthesis. But what we're finding uh, more and more is that uh, it's thriving uh, much more than, than we would like it to. And in particular, in areas with low oxygen, and high nutrients. And um, actually click the slide, I think it's still there. Uh, oh, sorry, go back. My, my bad, I had a, one of those animation, I guess it's not on here anymore. Um, where we have uh, slower, warmer uh, waters is in our reservoirs and that's what most of our swimming facilities are. Uh, and so that's why we're, we're finding more and more that it's appearing. Uh, what we don't know um, is what's triggering a bloom. Uh, when you have cyanobacteria, you may or may not have toxins with it. So even though we might have a lot of cyanobacteria um, present, it may not have the toxins. And I think you'll hear today that uh, what we're trying to do when we treat it is it's kind of a new um, technology that we're, we're, we're trying to apply to our lakes. Uh, the goal is to reduce the available nutrients, primarily phosphorus. And one way to do that um, that we're focusing on is increasing the oxygen uh, so that the nutrients are less available to the cyanobacteria. But that has, will have differing effects depending upon how many nutrients are there. And in places like Temescal, we have a lot of sediment um, that's accumulated over the past 100 years. And that means uh, it may take a long time for that oxygen to work. So uh, next slide. Uh, so what we've been doing since essentially 2014 is we've been honing our management and monitoring program of these harmful algal blooms. And I just wanna clarify that there are no um, state or federal regulations on the level of toxins that are allowed. They are, they're not regulated. What, what we've been doing is relying on expert guidance from the state um, and feds, but there are um, actually not uh, regulatory limits. Um, I think it just went back to the notes view. Uh, and so we've been focusing our efforts on signage, uh, education mm -hmm. and communication, which uh, is, has been evolving over time. We've also upped our, uh, our monitoring and our, our lab analysis skills in particular, we have our own in-house lab to evaluate the toxins. And we're also doing a lot more monitoring of our watersheds for the nutrients than we, we ever did before. Uh, and all of this is just to ensure that we can be as proactive in notifying our visitors and particularly the um, dogs that swim in our, our lakes that, uh, that it's safe to swim. Next slide. So I just wanna give you the overview since 2014, how we're doing with our closures. Uh, so these are total closures. So some of them may be in the non-swimming season, but as you can see with Temescal, um, we've had over a hundred days of closures. And uh, even in, in Lake Anza, we've, we've reached that. Uh, and our, probably our biggest concern or our biggest number of closures is at Quarry Lake. And that will be our next uh, remediation effort once we get Temescal and Anza under our belts. Uh, next slide. So that's just showing that. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Hal McLean, who is going to talk specifically about what we've been doing in Temescal this year. Thank you, Becky. Good afternoon, Director Lane and other members of the committee. I'm Hal McLean, the Water Management Supervisor for the district. Why are we getting these cyanobacteria blooms? In order to under understand our cyanobacteria problem, we hired limnologists who study lakes and reservoirs. And like most reservoirs, Lake Temescal constantly collects sediments and nutrients from its surrounding watershed. Built in 1868, Lake Temescal has had many years to accumulate both sediments and nutrients. This leads to excess nutrients or eutrophication and algae can th thrive in these excess nutrients. The red line on this uh, map shows the outline or Tem Temescal's relatively small watershed, but two freeways and dense neighborhoods within its watershed continually contribute to water quality issues. Next slide. 
Nutrients flo flowing from the surrounding watershed is called external loading, but older reservoirs like Temescal can also have what's called internal loading. Internal loading or internal cycling is when a reservoir has a lack of oxygen that accumulates at the bottom of the reservoir. Without oxygen at the sediment layer, problematic chemical reactions readily occur, releasing nutrients, primarily phosphorus, from its sediments to be released and become available for algae to utilize. Many say nitrogen drives cyanobacteria production, but phosphorus is needed in much smaller quantities for cyanobacteria to, gr to grow. Thus, phosphorus is considered the limiting resource. Most cyanobacteria remediation focuses on limiting phosphorus availability. Next slide. In 2015, in order to understand Temescal's nutrient loading and eutrophication, our then IPM resource analyst, Pamela Bites, did some baseline water quality monitoring and worked with her alma mater, Cal State East Bay, to get a master's student to help us monitor and understand Temescal's eutrophic condition. Together, they showed that both external and internal loading were big issues at Temescal. In this graph, you can see the deeper you go, the higher the phosphorus concentration. We eventually started monthly water quality monitoring at Tem Temescal, which has been paying dividends ever since. Next. To reduce the frequency and intensity of the cyan cyanobacteria blooms, our limnologist consultants recommended dredging. But since dredging is deemed too expensive, they recommended binding the phosphorus. So in 2016, we started and we've done three applications of phosphorus binding agents. To help the pro prolong these treatments, We've included beach maintenance, which is removing aquatic weeds and spot treating small accumulations of cyanobacteria within the swim ropes, swim area, and lake. Next. The treatments and maintenance initially worked well and held the phosphorus to acceptable levels for two years, but external nutrient loading continued with winter stormwater runoff and sewer spills. And our monitoring showed internal loading and rebounding of phosphorus in the sediments. The cyanobacteria also began to return, though much milder in magnitude. This graph shows the phosphorus levels at the surface and, the, and at the bottom of our Northwest dock monitoring sites. From the left-hand side, phosphorus spikes at both sites before our, two, before our phosphorus binding treatments at the blue arrows. And then the treatments keep the phosphorus down until phosphorus spikes in the 2019 summer at the red arrow. With internal loading increasing in the summer of 2019, we were planning on another phosphorus binding treatment for the spring of 2020 when we were approached by a professional colleague and consultant with a, with a pilot project. Next. This, pri this pilot was a relatively new oxygenation technology called nanobubbles. Like other oxygenation strategies, we want to increase oxygen throughout the water column and especially along the sediments. This will reduce the chemical reactions that lead to internal loading. Next. In order to gauge the success of the pilot, our consultant had worked out a remote real-time water quality monitoring system with probes near the surface and near the bottom. Here's the dashboard. We can pick from many water quality parameters and timeframes to assess how the system is operating. We put the monitoring system in before we installed the nanobubbler to get a baseline condition. The nanobubbler was installed at the yellow arrow, arrow. Note the red circle. We had dissolved oxygen at the surface in the orange line and no dissolved oxygen at the bottom of the lake, which is the blue line. And yes, we could watch our water quality online at any time. Next. Of course, you have to resize or size an oxygenation system to your water body. And due to the limited space available at Temescal, we had to settle for a smaller than recommended system. Since we can't accommodate a full size shipping container on site, we installed two small trailers. This means the system was a bit undersized and was installed on August 14th. But like every new piece of equipment, there are a few bumps. 
Our district electricians were extremely helpful in solving several supply problems and field fitting this new technology to our system sites. Next. Here are the location of the units along the eastern shore in the yellow stars. And the pipes go off to the north. And then the water quality, water quality monitoring sites are in the white X's. Next. These graphs show conditions near the sediments before our install are yellow at our yellow arrow. And the data goes up to the last week uh, to last week. The bottom graph shows dissolved oxygen and that Temescal is currently oxygenated. The top graph shows that we have an elevated oxidation reduction potential or ORP, which keeps chemical reactions in a favorable favorable direction. This positive oxidation reduction potential keeps phosphorus in the sediments. We've had smaller blooms of cyanobacteria during this pilot, but remember all remedi remediations have their limits. We want to reduce the occurrence and the intensity of these cyanobacteria blooms. We are awaiting our final report evaluating the nanobubblers. Oops, next uh, slide please. We are awaiting a final report evaluating the nanobubblers' effectiveness. We will be working with operations to determine the next steps. We are also looking into expanding the sediment basins from the creek inputs into Lake Temescal to, lit up, to limit sedimentation into the lake and further reduce external loading sources. And we're also looking into funding options for dredging and further remediation. Now I'll pass it on to Ed Culver our fisheries biologist too, to talk about our project at Lake Anza. Uh, thank you, Hal. Um, sorry, I'm, my computer all of a sudden has decided to not allow me to click to the next slide. There we go. Um, good afternoon, Director Lane and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Edward Culver and I'm the fisheries biologist for the park district. Uh, and I will be presenting some information about our remediation efforts at Lake Anza today. Um, Lake Anza, like Lake Temescal, is eutrophic, meaning that it, ha it has excess nutrients. Um, Lake Anza is relatively small at about 10 surface acres, but surprisingly, it supports a native rainbow trout population. Um, because Lake Anza is entirely owned by the park district, that makes it a really good candidate for remediation. Uh, however, unlike the relatively shallow four and a half meter Lake Temescal, Lake Anza is fairly steep sided and is about 16 meters deep. Lake Anza also differs from Lake Temescal in that it maintains a thermocline through, uh, uh, throughout much of the year. Um, a thermocline is a very steep uh, temperature gradient within a layer of water which separates the warm mixed waters uh, near the surface from the cold, deep, nutrient-laden waters at the bottom. The thermocline maintains these cold, deep nutrient waters uh, that are really essential for trout during our uh, warm summers. Uh, it, it provides refuge for, for our trout uh, to, to escape to. Um, and, and typically during the summer, Lake Anza's surface waters can actually reach almost 80 degrees uh, or about 25 degrees Celsius, while the waters below the thermocline rarely exceed 10 degrees Celsius or about 50 degrees. Uh, so here you can see uh, the last three years worth of temperature data that we have for Lake Anza. Um, I really like this graph and I, I think that it really illustrates how the lake stratifies in the summer. Uh, you can see each of these 15 lines represents a different one meter depth in the lake. We have a vertical profile that, uh, of 15 loggers, one at each meter at the deepest point in the lake. Um, this gives us a real time data about the different strata of the lake. Uh, and it also gives us the ability to sort of see things as they happen. Um, for example, you can see in the spring where these red arrows are pointing, uh, when the lake begins to stratify, which is meaning that it sort of starts to separate out in layers, you can see that the surface starts to warm while the water at the, at the bottom of the lake continues to remain cold. Um, as summer progresses, you see that these lines continue to warm and separate or further stratify. Um, all of this stratification comes to a really abrupt end as we move into fall and we receive our first significant rainfall, typically around the end of November. Um, this event is called a turnover and something that we've come to anticipate every autumn in Lake Anza. 
So as I said, Lake Anza is eutrophic, um, meaning that it has, uh, that it's very nutrient rich. Uh, one of the nutrients that is essential to algal growth is phosphorus, as Hal said. Um, this graph really represents the uh, phosphorus that is available to algae in Lake Anza over the last four years. Uh, these red arrows point to how much phosphorus becomes available in the lake for algae every summer. Um, these nutrient loading events uh, uh, really during the summer exceed sort of what is considered the maximum threshold for algal growth, which is sort of the red bar at the bottom, essentially meaning that Lake Anza becomes sort of an all-you-can-eat buffet for algae each summer. Um, so with the assistance of a professional colleague and limnologist, Dr. Alex Horn, uh, we reviewed Lake Anza with respect to 17 different uh, available lake management techniques and decided to work towards the installation of a hypolimnetic oxygenation system, or HOS. Um, we decided that an HOS is preferential for Lake Anza uh, because they're designed to pump liquid oxygen through a diffuser into the hypolimnion or the bottom of the lake. This keeps the substrate or sediments of the lake cool and oxygenated, which then reduces the amount of uh, nutrients that are available to them. These systems are designed to maintain the summer stratification and provide oxygen to the cold, deep waters essential for rainbow trout uh, and, and, and similar systems have actually already been installed elsewhere, including at the San Francisco Public Utility Commission and the East Bay Municipal Utility District. So we installed this oxygenation system in uh, July of 2020 and, and act activated the system on July 28th. Um, you can see uh, once the oxygenation system was installed, we continued to uh, monitor weekly water quality uh, and actually discovered an incident. Um, so you can see on this blue line is, is where the uh, uh, oxygenation started. Um, and you can see fairly quickly uh, that the, the lake water temperature um, almost immediately responds with the bottom of the lake becoming warmer until the lake completely mixes on August 5th. Um, we responded and turned down the oxygenation system in the hopes that the lake would restratify. And you can kind of start to see that restratification happening. Um, however, it, it never really fully restratified. Um, we were concerned that this mixing of the warm water would, would cause a potential fish kill or would stress the trout out, um, but we have uh, continued to observe the lake and, and have not seen any fish kills since the turnover, so we're, um, we're uh, hopeful that, that nothing happened. Um, so we, we were really interested in knowing why this turnover happened in August instead of November. Um, there are a few theories and, and probably all of them sort of combined helped um, we did have a bit of a strange cold spell in August uh, with really gusty winds. You can see uh, where I marked August 5th on this red arrow, um, where the orange line represents the wind speed and the blue line represents the air temperature. Um, on August 5th was one of our coldest days of the season, as well as uh, one of our highest wind speed days of the year. Um, so these factors certainly could have contributed to the turnover, um, but we do suspect that the energy released from the bubbles may have actually impacted the lake. Um, and, and so that was why we uh, responded by turning the system down. Um, however, unfortunately, after this turnover happened, um, nutrients that are traditionally sequestered in the hypolimnion or the, the depth of the lake became mixed throughout the lake. And this caused a, a pulse of nutrients, which uh, caused a, an algal bloom that continues to this day. Uh, the photo on the right I took yesterday at Lake Anza, and you can still see the little green specks um, in the water that, that indicate a cyanobacteria bloom. Um, so I, I did want to go back to the phosphorus graph because I think it's really important to sort of show um, that this is an updated graph, including information from the last couple of months. Um, you can actually see that at the time of the installation of the oxygen system, that we were already experiencing one of our most intense internal loadings of phosphorus in the four years of data. Uh, this certainly contributed to the algae bloom that we had this year. Um, some options that we have, we, we could uh, try to get rid of this uh, cyanobacteria bloom uh, through the use of algicide products. Um, however, uh, we know that cold temperatures and shorter days uh, cause these blooms to die out. And, and because we don't have swimming currently at Lake Anza, um, it, it may be more beneficial for us to uh, just play the waiting game and allow the lake to uh, restratify itself naturally as you, as you sort of saw in the previous temperature graphs. Uh, so finally, uh, this graph does show the dissolved oxygen in the lake. 
Um, the red arrow uh, points to where the oxygenation system was turned on. Uh, you can see the rapid increase in the dissolved oxygen caused by the uh, oxygenation system being turned on. Uh, you can then sort of see the restratification that started to occur after the premature turnover um, when we had turned down the system. Um, but to me, what I think is really important to note on this graph is that after we were able to um, maintain the system, we were actually able to steadily increase the oxygenation of the lake. And you can see that, that, um, that the lake is now above seven milligrams per liter. And to me, as a fisheries biologist, seven milligrams per liter is very important. It's sort of the ideal uh, uh, um, dissolved oxygen for rainbow trout. Um, so this graph is essentially telling us that throughout the entire water column of Lake Anza, uh, there is now enough water or uh, dissolved oxygen to benefit rainbow trout. Um, and this is not something that has ever occurred in Lake Anza. Typically below a certain depth, Lake Anza is anoxic or means that it doesn't have any oxygen. So um, I think that this is a really important uh, uh, a point to finish on. So moving forward, we're, we're really hoping for the restratification of the lake to, to begin in March or April when it typically does as the days get longer and the, the sun starts to warm the lake uh, longer. Once this restratification starts, we hope to continue closely monitoring the sustained dissolved oxygen in the bottom of the lake. The HOS should be able to help maintain the oxygen in the deep waters, and it should be able to limit the availability of phosphorus in 2021 and beyond, which should reduce the amount of harmful algal blooms that we have. Um, and, and with that, I, I just wanna thank all the people who have helped make these projects possible. Um, we had uh, a, a lot of uh, experience and we had a lot of uh, colleagues help us out as well as park staff um, who have helped with these projects. Um, and, and with that, we'll uh, take any questions that you might have. All right, well, thank you very much. I think, um looking at Temescal and Lake Anza and the differences is, is really a fascinating uh, process and all of the things we have been trying. I was hoping the, uh, we'd have total success with Lake Anza, but maybe next year. So, uh, all right, so um, any questions from um, um, bo uh, board members? Or comments? Well, I, I, I'll go when you want to go first, Elizabeth. Sure, it doesn't matter. I, I'm just interested to know um, going forward with Lake Ends. I know you said you hope that it it stratifies, it returns to its stratification. If it doesn't, um, are, then are you do you have other ideas in mind in terms of what you might try there? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question, Director Eccles. Um, I, I, I do believe that the, the lake will restratify. Um, naturally, the, the, uh, as we've seen in previous year's data, um, the lake does uh, sort of restratify um, just based on the, the, uh, um, the longer days and the warmer days that we have. Um, so I, I don't really have any inclination that it wouldn't do that. Um, but yeah, I, I do believe that we, we have plenty of, um, of options moving forward. I'm, I'm, I am quite hopeful that this system moving into the summer um, does show a, a decrease in the, in the level of phosphorus. And just to add to that, I mean, it was a surprise to us, you know, that it did cause the destratification. That's one of the reasons we actually picked this system was because we didn't want to have um, oxygen um, mixing. Uh, but I think one thing to do would be to turn the oxygen system down even further than it is. Thank you. Colin? So my comment is once again, I'm, I'm just amazed at the degree, depth and scope of uh, pure science that goes into the management of these parklands. And, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, amazed and pleased with the uh, work that management does with the scientists that are uh, on top of these issues. <clears throat> on uh, Tamaskau, are we not proceeding at this point on the assumption that the solution is going to be the expense of dredging and that what we're doing in the interim is designed just to manage and control the problem until we uh, put the funding together for that? Is that correct? 
So, I, I mean, I heard, you know, when we presented the dredging feasibility study to the board um, last year, I, I did hear the board say that they wanted to move forward with dredging. And I know that we are looking at those options. It, it takes some time to put that funding together and um, if it is in fact available. So we are focusing on these interim measures uh, as, a, as, a, as an interim step, both in reducing the sediment with uh, expanding the sediment basins and then also the nano bubbler to help improve water quality. And if nothing else, it can inform what works in other lakes or reservoirs. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, a bit off topic, but it occurs to me, I've heard on occasion that there are algae blooms along the sloughs up in the Delta and that I think I've heard out at Big Break that it's an occasional problem there. And I'm wondering to what degree folks have been involved with the, the Delta issues. Obviously we have a lot of Delta shoreline uh, up in um, my part of Eastern Contra Costa. So it just, uh, that would be of interest to me. We've definitely had um, harmful algal blooms, uh, outbreaks at Big Break that have exceeded um, swimming, say swimming levels. Sorry, there's a truck street sweeper coming by. Uh, and, but I don't know how we would remediate that because it's such a large area and we only, you know, it's not contained and we don't control much of the shoreline. So we actually haven't looked at that. How did you want to add anything to that? Um, the state has been uh, monitoring those, those areas and they don't really have any solutions. Um, but the monitoring has been getting better and it's, I, I, you know, I think they're working towards some sort of remediation, but it, it, it is pretty hard to control since it's the um, San Joaquin River. All the cats or willow, a picture of willow in the background. Yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, situation. Okay, I, I was just curious. Uh, this is not just the, the algae problem. It's not just an East Bay Parks or an East Bay problem. It's uh, much more expansive, I understand, in, in terms of where it's happening. Could you give us an idea? I mean, is this a, a, a California issue? Is it a Western United States issue? Is it a worldwide issue? Oh, it's, it's worldwide. It's worldwide. Um, it depends upon the age of the reservoirs and the, you know, the sediment and uh, nutrient inputs. But you know, it's in China, it's in Australia, it's in Europe, uh, it's in the East Coast. Uh, yeah, it's it's everywhere. So it's, do we it's know in the oceans? Yeah. I'm I'm wondering if we know, uh, and it's come up at, uh, on occasion, whether you know sustained drought periods are contributing to this, and that that might be indicative of where it's happening. Yeah, you know, um, there is a theory that uh, warmer water uh, contributes to blooms and certainly with warming temperatures through climate change, that can be a concern. Uh, rain, uh, you know, when you have rain coming in, it can decrease the temperature, it can move sediments through, it can also bring in more sediments and more nutrients. So it depends on the watershed as to what happens. And uh, you know, I mean, NOAA and even and the state of California, they're, they're trying to start modeling temperature and looking at perhaps trying to predict when a bloom would occur. Uh, and so now you can actually go on websites and see um, where they think, definitely where a, a bloom is based on um, aerial imagery, but they haven't really been able to predict blooms in the way that they would like. Okay, thank you. Oh, interesting. I have a, um, well, first I wanna say I appreciate the um, uh, program that you did in the stewardship uh, seminar you know, on this subject. I think everybody who saw that um, had their eyes opened to, um, to the problem and to what we've been trying to, to address. Temescal is, is just a really small body of water and now it's not very deep and one of the things that you talked about was um, wanting to um, redesign the sediment basin as it comes in. So what, what does that mean exactly? Are you, are you looking for opportunities to uh, widen the creeks that, that bring water in? 
And what is the possibility of actually doing that? Uh, so uh, I don't know if you recall, but when we did the dredging feasibility study, we also looked at how much sediment was moving through the watershed and coming into the lake. Mm -hmm. And we do have three sediment basins that are designed at the mouths of these outfalls or creeks. As the water comes in, they go into these basins first, they slow down and they're supposed to drop out the sediment before they enter the lake proper. But what this sediment analysis showed is that we're still getting close to a thousand cubic yards per year of sediment net coming into the lake. So that would explain that it's gonna keep filling in with sediment. So um, by expanding the sediment basins and making them bigger, we're hoping that we can capture more sediment so that we don't have any more sediment coming in. So that's the proposal to expand those existing sediment basins and they would be expanded into upland areas. Are these areas that we own? Yes, so these, these three outfalls are right adjacent to the lake. They're, they're, um, and so we would just have to make them a little bit bigger. Uh, um, I, I, can, I can send you a, a picture of what they look like and a picture of where we might be expanding them. So when we talk about dredging, we talk about the whole lake. Um, can we dredge the sediment basins at a... <laughs> yes, so the sediment basins, I, I should have made this clear, the sediment basins are designed um, and are dredged annually. And okay. right now we're, we're moving about 200 cubic yards a year from each of those sediment basins. Um, and what we're hoping to do is increase the size and increase the permit limits so that we can dredge out more sediment so that we don't, so that we reduce the overall amount um, entering the lake. Okay, I, I think that's really an excellent idea. So how long have we been doing that? I don't know when the, I mean, decades. How, do you know how long we've had those sediment basins and we've been dredging? I do not. Um, as long as we, as long as we. <laughs> I've been with the district 20 out. years. Exactly. and Someone should know. I've been with the district 20 years and they've been doing it the whole time I've been here. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing. I don't know how far it goes back, but throughout my entire time with the district, and I know it's been happening. I mean, there are a few years where we had issues with permits. Um, so I think uh, we missed a year or two, but for the most part, it's done every year. There, there was a, a study in the 70s that recommended those sediment basins. And I don't know when the sediment basins were actually created, but um, yeah, in the 70s, they they initially created those sediment basins to um, sequester water long enough to uh, kill off the bacteria because they were having ba high bacteria counts throughout the lake. And so in slowing the water going into the lake, um, the, the bacteria can't survive as long in these um, in these environments. It's a much colder environment for the for E. coli, and so they, they would die more than, than, than going straight into the lake. And, but then they wanted to get rid of the sediment as well. Okay, interesting. I, you know, we all want the, these bodies of water to be available in 2021. So um, yes. something people need. We're parks, right? Uh, so is the, do we have any public comment on this item? Okay. There are no public comments. Um, please raise your hand if you are in the audience and would like to comment on the previous presentation. I think we are good to go. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for the presentation. Again, very interesting. Um, our third and final agenda item is the East Bay Regional Park District's oral history program with an update provided by our archives program supervisor, Brenda Montana. Hello. Hello. Hello, Director Lane. And thank you, uh, Director Coffey and Director Eccles as well um, for giving us, giving me some time uh, to present on uh, something that's near and dear to me. Um, and then as well as I want to really thank all the predecessors uh, before me who uh, worked so hard on um, our history. I'm gonna share screen. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. So, and everybody could see the screen. Um, so I'm going to talk about the oral histories and give a, a little bit of an update. This year has been an unusual year um, due to uh, the pandemic and uh, actually working on on these things. So we kind of had like a little bit of a late start uh, working on oral histories. Um, I also want to introduce myself that uh, again, I'm the new um, uh, archives program supervisor, Brenda Montano. And uh, I um, in, am taking over, quote unquote, the oral histories uh, for the park district this year. The, it was formally um, oversought by the uh, cultural services coordinator in the uh, interpretive and recreation services department. So I also uh, wanted to make a note, I do have some very important people uh, as pictures on, on the slide. And of note is uh, on the left is Lawson Sakai, um, who uh, I, I just found out uh, recently that he has passed away. And uh, he was the last surviving member of a group of uh, uh, people who were part of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team uh, during World War II. And uh, he and a group of his uh, troop, his team, um, have a memorial set up at Roberts and it's actually called the 442nd Memorial. We've called it that for years. And uh, we, I just wanna uh, uh, honor him because uh, he was a very important man and we actually uh, interviewed him uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, so I'm kind of giving a little bit of a review of our archives program and I, I wanted to show some images, but I got overwhelmed with all the things that are actually in the archives um, and the subject matters uh, that we pursue and that we try to make sure that we have in, in our um, historic records and that um, oral histories and biographies are just a part of, of those uh, records, um, but a very important part. Um, so the importance of oral histories well, the first and foremost is always going to be uh, preserving those stories. Our, it's our, our, our spoken word and the history that we have uh, within each and every one of us is very important. And the Park District has a, a number of histories that are also a part of our region's history. And uh, I, I feel that it's our public service um, to provide these histories and to, to steward these histories and also for our staff as well to have a resource. Um, it also extends our legacy uh, and that means uh, showing where the district's been and um, the important people that, that um, contributed to that legacy and we can learn. Um, and then also too, it's a, it's a way to, to reach out to communities um, and reach out to, to people who may have had an impact on the park district, or um, we really want to learn something from them. Um, and then they're for inspiration and recognition, of course. Uh, and then they're also an opportunity to um, uh, explore in inclusion and diversity um, and try to get a lot of, of voices, different voices uh, to provide a, a um, cultural feel to our, our parklands. And of course, um, planning uh, our parks, programming and uh, at the history exhibits and, and um, panels, education that we see out in the parklands itself. And a little bit of history, how uh, oral histories kind of started here at the park district. Um, we, a lot of us know about uh, Tracy Parent and her, uh, her and her staff there at Black Diamond Lines who have one of the most robust archives collection at the Park District. And uh, Tracy started in the 1970s, late 1970s. This is a photo of her up in the upper right um, between two um, uh, descendants at um, Nortonville or Som Summersville Nor descendants. Um, and a group of, uh, of the naturalists that started back then started uh, interviewing a lot of people who were associated with the land and trying to learn from them and, and incorporate their stories in their programming. And since then, um, 
that 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 program, the oral history program, has continued on until uh, this year. However, um, there is a significant amount of history uh, in other departments as well, and and mainly the general manager's office and public affairs. And uh, Richard Trudeau uh, during the 1980s really wanted to um, the. Uh, um, highlight the district's history, and it had never really been done before. And he uh, decided that a great way to do that was to interview uh, founders uh, from 1934, either descendants or people who were involved with the district uh, in its early years. And then that continued on through um, public affairs and uh, um, people like our public information supervisor, former information supervisor, Ned Mackay did a few. Um, and then uh, for our 75th anniversary, Laura McCreary uh, had done an interview at Oral History with Richard Trudeau, and we thought uh, she would be perfect to write a history, um, another history in 25 years of, after Vision Achieved uh, called The Living Landscape. And there too were a lot of um, uh, oral histories came out of that as well. And so, um, and now we have my position, the archives program supervisor, hopefully um, will be able to coordinate uh, the oral histories going forward. And uh, uh, last but not least is the, the um, acquisition stewardship and development department uh, and uh, their need and use of oral histories and interviews to discover um, the history of the land um, and and uh, uh, I I'm understand in 2021, uh, hopefully we will be able to also be working with the cultural services coordinator um, uh, to provide input on oral histories. So uh, I made this map. It's not scientific. It's mostly just digging in the drawers and um, kind of looking and seeing all of our completed oral histories, and that would be. Uh, available, even available to the public to, to read. And uh, I, for the most part, there's about 400 oral histories in our uh, collection. Um, and then I would say maybe about 80 to 100 incomplete transcripts. And that means either transcripts that have been interviewed but not edited or proofread or um, interviews that uh, maybe the person passed away and or they're just uh, we don't have enough paperwork in, in order to release them as final um, uh, transcripts. But as you can see by the, the map, um, the number of oral histories that we have are very um, heavy in uh, certain areas um, and uh, near Black Diamond Mines, of course. And uh, then also too, I found a, a lot of oral histories done uh, near um, Ardenwood and, and about Ardenwood. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about the, the shorelines and um, the delta of, of, of possibilities of where, how we can find other uh, people to interview that might have um, stories about these lands as well. Uh, this was something else, uh, an idea about some of the gaps. If we don't have uh, uh, people who might be have been involved with the land, of course, there usually always is. Um, but uh, there are also a, a lot of uh, former supervisors, park supervisors, and unit managers, and people who've worked for the district who know some things about the history of the parks as well. Um, so uh, this is an example of one, and uh, just a, a kind of like a suggestion or an idea of how we can look at filling the gaps of, of our histories. And uh, so we don't have a professional uh, oral historian on our staff at the Park District. Um, we have relied heavily on um, contracting for this, um, but really great partners. And we have um, Bev Ortiz, who was the former uh, cultural services coordinator um, to create a really great partnership with the Oral History Center at UC Berkeley, um, who uh, they're repository is the Bancroft Library. So that's um, even greater. And we have been contracting with them to find um, people to interview and also uh, providing lists for them to, to interview. 
And then another uh, person that we contract with is Laura McCreary. She, uh, we tend to, um, if we wanted to do more fuller uh, administrative level um, oral histories, we would, we would uh, um, hire her. And then also Tracy Parent, who has retired. Um, she um, is, I don't know if she's doing her dream job now, but she's still contracting. Um, she's been contracting for many years now uh, for uh, just oral histories. And uh, she has been um, uh, finishing them. And I'll, I'll talk about a few of them that she's done this year. And here's kind of a, a, a little bit of how the funding works for the oral histories and their production. Um, uh, we contract, uh, this year we contracted with UC, UC Berkeley for $40,000. And that's about $3,500 per, per final transcript. So there's a lot that goes on before there's a final transcript. And then um, Tracy, um, uh, $10,000, and that is to really uh, finish uh, the um, incomplete transcripts. Um, and then uh, Laura McCreary on a case-by-case uh, uh, -case basis, we don't always uh, contract with her, but when we do, um, those, those uh, oral histories are, are a significantly more amount of money. Um, she also uh, would be able to do some interviews for $4,000. Uh, those would only be vid video interviews. And UC Berkeley, the Oral History Center at UC Berkeley has, uh, I, I discovered kind of a different way of how they do their, their um, interviews and their final transcripts. Many of their final transcripts are, are just the transcript itself. And uh, the Park District in, in the past, when we've uh, contracted with, with the oral historians, it was the transcript, which maybe was about 20 pages long um, or even less. And the majority of the, the oral history had photographs and, and um, newspaper articles and a supplemental text that talks about the history and the significance of it. But because these are at a, a much more um, simpler format, we can do more interviews per year um, and I'll talk a, later, a little bit later why that's so important. And uh, this year, because of the pandemic, um, which is actually great uh, too, because um, now that we can do Zoom, um, we're able to get more interviews uh, conducted as well as um, look and um, see for opportunities for people who live not here, but in other places in the country that we could still interview them. Um, and with UC Berkeley, you know, their, their interviews are, are online, so we can always access these uh, via PDF. Um, there are audiovisual clips available. Um, and then we have a very, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Bancroft Library is the repository. So it's a very, you know, reliable repository. And, uh, but of course, the Park District will also receive copies and have have their own repository of these oral histories. And here's an example of what you would see online. Uh, this is Gretchen Fretter. She worked for the Park District as a, a public safety officer. And uh, she was uh, the first woman uh, a detective. And uh, she um, uh, provided us an interview in a couple years ago. Um, but she's one of the many people that we have that you could go online and read their transcript I, I pulled this out from her uh, oral history and I thought it was kind of significant of the times because I know that there has been some interest about um, Fulmer Peak and its, its naming. And uh, it just so happens that she knew um, August Fulmer as a child and has um, a, you know, childhood experiences of him and how important the park district was to him and uh, that he would actually take groups of children up to the parks. Um, and uh, so I think that that was a, a really uh, neat uh, memory and something um, that's useful for us to know that, that uh, this history exists. So in um, 2020, um, we had uh, quite a few incomplete transcripts that were backlogged at UC Berkeley in the Oral History Center. 
And with the help of uh, the archives volunteers, thank you, um, we were able to start reading and proofreading quite a number of oral histories. And I feel that this is a really great success that, that we've had this many oral histories released this year. And release is, by what I mean by release is that they're available to the public and we've also got a bound copy in our archives. Um, um, I put asterisk a, a, a few people that have actually passed away within the um, time that we've they've been interviewed. So um, that's also part of what I'd like to say is, um, you know, once they're gone, they're gone. We can't interview them. Um, and so to, to get their voices and um, their memories and um, have them be inspirations for future generations is, is um, critical to get them when we can. Um, and I just, uh, Tracy Parent, this is her work this year. I uh, have to say that if you get a chance, I, I, these should be available to the public soon. But um, these are just incredible stories. And if you see how many pages they are, um, these are descendants and people who uh, have a lot of memories and history um, about the land and black, black Diamond Line. Um, and uh, growing up there at the Rotter Ranch, um, uh, mainly. And I think that these are just going to be um, treasures for the families and as well for the park district. Um, it is a great accomplishment. And it did take 40, 43 years. And I, I, I wanted to bring this up that um, even in the uh, uh, credits, there's a Bob Doyle as the park worker who was part of um, the interview. So he, he asked a few questions in there. So I was surprised to see him in there, but it's, it's pretty sweet. Um, and uh, this year, uh, we got kind of a late start, but we're, we're working on quite a few oral histories. And some of the ones that have been conducted uh, this year was uh, Carol France, Lonnie Hancock, John Sutter, and Doug Seiden. Um, we really wanted to get some interviews from, from these folks. And uh, Lonnie is kind of a new area that I will talk about soon, I think. Yes. So um, these are the oral histories that are on schedule um, to be conducted uh, through April of 2021 um, with, with our contract with UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, these are just like a list of names that came from planning, and uh, stewardship as well as from public affairs, the general manager's office. And one of the new uh, categories is what I'm calling it is, is the advocacy and governance category, which um, we haven't really um, uh, delved into that much in the past few years. And this one is to, to look at people who, are, who have advocated for the district in one way or another, or been part of a program, for example, Barbara Lee, um, in many aspects that she's been involved, but um, I was uh, very interested in trying to create a history around the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center, um, which um, was born out of the um, MLK shoreline um, and uh, in the, um, the shoreline center that's currently there was the first home of the Freedom Center. So there's this, a lot of history there. And the new initiatives for this year, um, we have the archives volunteers. Uh, I meet with them weekly. And uh, if you see the Zoom picture that's there, there's a lot of, I call them celebrities. They're um, Jerry Kent and Dave Zuckerman, Paul Miller, um, uh, uh, Bethia Stone, Ned Mackay. These are all folks that um, I meet and uh, get their advice from, and as well as uh, try to run the archives, even in these remote times. Uh, there, uh, the other things that we're trying to do right now, and I, I put uh, Crystal Jimenez, this photo up there, um, because uh, I've been able to contract with her. She uh, formerly worked at Black Diamond Mines for many years. Uh, in the archives and supporting the oral history program. And so um, she is very knowledgeable of the master list, 
which is right now a almost 500 page uh, Word doc that um, I'm uh, working uh, on that with her um, as a project to have a new electronic um, database for the um, uh, oral history so that they're very much easier to, to um, look for and research and track uh, where they're at. That's a, a lot of work. It's very tedious to um, do, but we really want to see how we can get these oral histories online for the public and um, online, quote unquote, for staff. Um, because right now it's uh, you know it's it's very difficult to to find the oral histories that we have and to make other people know these are available to to read and to be. Um, to be shared with. Um, and then the last is that uh, so after maybe about three years of work, we have been um, uh, working with Media Preserve and Pres Preservation Technologies. Thank you to um, Kate Collins, who was the former supervising naturalist at uh, Black Diamond Mines, who um, at the time uh, was very concerned about the cassette tapes. Um, that were stored at Black Diamond Mines, as well as I had my own, um, or I, it, the archives, the Trudeau archives had a lot of, of audiovisual tapes that I was very worried about um, them deteriorating and, us, and not being available for the future. Uh, we received uh, $14,000 from Regional Parks Foundation and uh, the remaining came from the park district uh, to fund um, digitizing these tapes. And also that's part of Crystal's contracting work with me is to um, make sure that those are um, organized and put into the database. And so I wanted to share with you uh, three little short segments of some of the oral histories that came back from Media Preserve. We just received our first hard drive. We're gonna be receiving another hard drive pretty maybe in about four or five months of additional of recordings, um, but these are just some of the, the examples of the, the, rec uh, the audio visual files. Oops, I'm sorry, went back to, should be able to. And uh, sort of how you, how you know Dick and maybe how long you've known him. And let's kind of go around real fast. Okay, Ray Dawson, uh, I met Dick back in the early 70s and uh, I, I worked uh, for him on several campaigns, and uh, I've known Dick for at least, uh, I would say, 30 years. And you're working for East Bay Regional Park District to this very day? I'm working for East Bay Regional Park District currently. Nancy. I'm Nancy McKay. I was hired by Dick Trudeau in 1967 to work as a student intern in the Public Affairs Office, and he found me other jobs, and I've stayed there all this time. And the next one. Then uh, when the last one died, uh, uh, Mrs. Rowell died, you know, she met, she met uh, sort of territory to the regional park, see, for a half price, you know. But, so. Well, Fritz, what, what did the cowboys think about your food? Oh, man, they like it, yes. Oh, naturally. Because, you know, we cooked our own, we uh, killed our own beef, you know. So I, uh, I always took the best. <laughs> and uh, Jean Siri? I don't know how many parks. It's mostly parks. And when we started, I remember the city council roaring with laughter when we talked about making the shoreline something that people could use and not just heavy industry. They just thought that was the biggest joke of all. Get the money, they said, get the money. But it's not, not so anymore and, and all it, since the population is growing, so it's just gotta be added to. And we gotta save the fish in the bay and in the streams because the, the fishing is not what it was, will never be what it was and there are more people. Too many people, too many cars. I'm really glad I won't live forever. 
That's a good conclusion. That's a good conclusion. It's true. It's true. And then um, I also wanted to uh, make this time to talk about wanting to formalize an archives and cultural history advisory group. And but well, one, one focus for today would be is to have a, a way to coordinate between um, all the representation that might have some input on oral histories um, and bring them together maybe you know, twice a year to actually talk about uh, what interviews should be done. Um, and then also to, to have a time to really look at the status of, of the oral histories and, what, and what, um, what direction it should take. Um, so this was a kind of a suggestion. This is actually from the needs assessment report as well as one of the recommendations. And uh, I also put together a list of ideas, um, and this would be something that would be uh, really, uh, I would look forward to working with a, an advisory group about some of the other subjects uh, and developing oral histories around these. These were just some that, that uh, uh, came from just this year and the inquiries that, and requests that I've received from, from the public and from uh, the board and from my own uh, department about some of the history in our parks. And the, these are some of this history is just um, not there and it could be a really great opportunity if we could find some oral histories um, to fill in those gaps. And um, not, to, not to ignore the person to the right there, but uh, he is due to complete his oral history uh, in 2021 with, uh, um, the great help of Laura McCreary. And I am so looking forward to that oral history. And I think it's gonna be just amazing and a gem. And I think I thank our general manager for spending the time that he has on images and um, providing that information to Laura. Um, so really looking forward to that one. And that's the end of my presentation. And uh, I would like to open for questions and I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Brenda. So my gosh, I had no idea we... You're muted, Beverly. Beverly, you got muted. <laughs> I do know that, um, that Tracy is working on former you know, oral histories that did not get completed and that um, we have to give her a lot of credit for doing that because that's not the ideal way to do it. You know, you want to do the oral history and then you want to do the supporting things that you need to do and then get a commitment from the person that you can use it and then complete it. So what she is finding is is gaps with people who passed and, and um, so I know there's been some frustration to it too. So pretty remarkable what she's put together and what you're yes, doing. Agree. <laughs> uh, so are there some questions for, for Brenda at this time? Yeah. Uh, not really a question, but I, I want to thank Brenda for, for her work. And you know, this is so important to preserve the cultural history and the stories uh, that these people have and to preserve them for, for both for us and for future generations and to really have that that flavor for what things were like. And um, so really appreciate the work that you're doing. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Colin? All right, well, a couple of thoughts as those lists uh, cross the screen of people. Under governance and advocacy, you may want to consider Tom Torlakson, former Senator who Thank you, yes. Engaged yes. a lot of advocacy efforts on behalf of the district or in partnership with the district for a long time. Uh, and eventually, obviously Nancy Skinner, but that's going to yes. be something, you know, she's continuing to make history and make history with the, with the district and she'd be a good candidate at some point to get all that down. Um, also, I, you know, as a, uh, I'm, I'm thinking now the categories that you, try to create, to focus on in creating these histories. 
And as a uh, you know, UC Berkeley history graduate, <laughs> I have a particular bias. Um, and that has to do with the remarkable uh, historic relationship between UC Berkeley and this park district going back to its founding. Uh, I got some material from, uh, I think it was Jerry Kent about a year ago uh, that uh, uh, talked in detail about the founding, the founding years. And uh, repeatedly you keep, show, keep showing, uh, you keep reading uh, uh, UC Berkeley influences, people or, or just departmental influences. And, and uh, it, 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 it is a remarkable history. And as we've just seen, it goes on in depth today with this very program that we're sitting here talking about and, and who's involved there. It would be um, wonderful to someday get that historic relationship uh, in, in, a, in a book, you know, and it deserves a history book. I've always thought, you know, that's something maybe a grad student uh, at uh, UC Berkeley could work on as a, as a project or, or something like that. But um, you could also make it a focus of an oral history, you know, and, and just a thought to, to throw out there. Thank you, Director Coffey. I, I, I totally agree. And um, that's one of my favorite subjects as well. Well, they're all my favorite subjects, but um, you know, we had the founders event last year um, and that was an inspiration just to find out that there were a number of descendants from the founders who um, that we were able to connect with uh, and uh, that is how we ended up uh, having two oral histories done um, based on Ansel Hall's work, who Ansel Hall did was res residing at UC Berkeley at the time as well. Um, and we were able to interview his son. Um, and then also uh, um, she would be uh, his, would be his, his granddaughter, Johanna Hall. So um, yes, I'm very uh, interested in that too, of, of finding people who might have, um, how do you say, passed down, who have received the passed down um, history that we, we've just never really tapped into yet. Yeah. Uh, so Elizabeth, you wanted to add? Sorry, muted. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to add on, I was writing down in my notes as you were talking about the new advocacy governance section, because I also had some thoughts that I was going to share with you later, but <laughs> might as well just say it now. So so the other person along the same lines that Colin was saying is um, is Congressman Mark DeSaulnier, I think would be a good person to have on the list. And I think you may have already had George Miller on the list, but if you didn't, you know, certainly he's always been an incredible advocate for our parks as well. So. Yes, Director Eccles, I, I agree. I, I think George Miller is a really important um, person and I, I put him on the schedule and um, we're, we're planning on reaching out to him soon. Um, but yes, Great. definitely. Thank you. Yeah, well, I really appreciate the presentation, Brenda, and the, all the work you've done. I think it's pretty um, remarkable, the, the group of uh, Energetic Wednesday folks you have um, and um, a great help to us because some of them are bringing their archives in themselves, aren't they? Yes, actually, um, I just was, uh, I, I had a box dropped off to me just this week from um, one of the volunteers. So, um, uh, and they're, they're my best advocates for, for history from other people as well. Um, they, do, they do the outreach, they're just, it's, I, it's unspeakable how I can talk about how appreciative I am to be in this situation and to have the volunteers working that I'm working with. I thought your map was very interesting <laughs> um, as well. And I, I think, you know, what's been happening in recent years is efforts on the part of uh, the planning department to do oral histories that are connected with new parks. And I know that was done for Sycamore Valley Open Space with the Wood, Wood family and some others, and um, for Burrell, um, some some very interesting oral histories of at least I know of at least two people who have now passed, who were uh, interviewed for those. So I think we are seeing that as as a, important with our new parks, which is a good. Um, 
good system. So I see we have Brian here. So Brian Holt from Planning and GIS. Yeah, hi, thank you, Director Lane. Um, I just wanted to jump in and take this opportunity real quick. One, thank you, Brenda. Um, uh, we've always appreciate partnering with Brenda on these and, and she does a fantastic job and has a great presentation. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick update, Director Lane, and to, to the committee. Um, Brenda made reference a number of times to um, retired uh, Dr. Beverly Ortiz um, in the cultural services coordinator position. So I did just wanna give you an update. That position has posted today. Um, so the recruitment is uh, beginning for that position and we hope to hope to have somebody on there um, soon in the early part of next year. So um, just wanted to take the opportunity to give you an update on that. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. All right, so are there any other questions or comments? Thank you again, Brenda. Thank really. you. Uh, so this, uh, this concludes our regular agenda. Uh, today, but we still have one more. I well, we have a couple of other items, but one, of course, is uh, public comments on um, items that are not on the agenda. And so I'm going to turn to uh, Coca to ask her um, if we do have people who would like to speak to us um, today and also to um, ask her to read the um, emails that we have received. So Coca, so do we have some people who want to speak to us um, on Zoom here? Yes, I believe we do. Um, we don't, we aren't necessarily sure about each person. So I think we can just call upon them um, and see if they have a public comment they'd like to make. So, All right, and you're, and you're gonna manage that. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I see an Evelyn Anderson. Um, Evelyn, if you are there, please go ahead and unmute yourself um, and you can feel free to speak. Hello? Hello? Hello, we can hear you. You can um, hear me? Yes. And just so you know, we have two minutes um, per speaker. Uh, basically, I wanted to watch this because I belong to Golden Gate Audubon and uh, we got some information about a um, uh, rather extreme measures being taken at uh, Cesar Chavez uh, Regional Park uh, concerning cats being exterminated in, you know, in the nighttime. Uh, and I don't feel that's really an appropriate measure. Um, I think these animals should be treated with more respect and probably trapped and uh, neutered and, and uh, turned over to uh, places that can make arrangements for uh, their socialization and also adoption. So right. I, I, I was under the impression that this matter was going to be discussed today and uh, it's nowhere on the agenda and I have I've stuck with uh, your presentation all this time and nothing's been said about that. Yeah, it, it, it is not on our, our agenda was posted some time ago, but uh, we, you're certainly able to address us on, on that topic. Uh, do you have anything else that you would like to add? Uh, not really. I, I would just really like to see uh, uh, the the basically killing of these animals stopped and, and other measures found to address the situation. Um, in the unfortunate position of being a birder, uh, I love birds and, all and cats. Uh, so it's, you know, all right. So it's all right. Yeah. I don't hear anything. Yeah, Colin? Yeah, I just think it should be pointed out that since this isn't on our agenda, uh, items not on the agenda, we're prevented by the Brown Act from actually discussing them. Uh, so we don't have any dialogue or interaction uh, over issues br brought to us that are not currently on our agenda. But we can certainly consider it for future agendas where we can discuss it and work on it. Yeah. 
Well, that's comforting because uh, some people have tried to to take this matter up with uh, with uh, the East Bay um, district and not had any contact at all about it. And a lot of people are concerned about this. All right. Well, thank you for your comments. I'm, uh, sure. you know, um, Cesar Chavez is not one of our parks. Um, it's not, is it? I see. No, but, um, but I, I appreciate your opinion on it. And thank you for coming and spending the time and waiting to come and talk to us. Sure. Okay, Coco, do you, uh, Coca, do you have another? Yes, speak? Um, thank you. We also have a Christina Tarr that is in the meeting, but um, Christina, it looks like you don't have a mic. Let me know if that's incorrect. Um, and otherwise we will move on to a Melissa Clack. All right, what is the name again? It's, it's me. Well, I, yes. I, it's Melissa Clack. Okay. I, yes, I have the same. Um, and it actually, I think she's mistaken about which park it is. It's the Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Shoreline Park. Um, I am also um, advocating that this behavior is completely unacceptable. It shows a lack, a complete failure um, in management to handle the situation properly. I actually am, I walk that park every single day. I am a wildlife advocate and I'm also an animal, general animal advocate. I personally have rescued dumped cats. These cats are not feral, they're abandoned. There's a huge difference between the two. And proper management is reaching out to the community, all the volunteers, all the foundations that have been established for situations exactly like this. Now, shooting them at night, knowing full well that they are act were actually being managed at the time is really apprehensible. And there's no excuse in this situation for that. Um, I do, I'm asking right now that this would be put on the park's agenda because this behavior, I, I went to your sites, I've read through this. I'm in the legal profession and really, <laughs> I actually have four of these quote unquote feral cats who are now live in my home. They were abandoned animals um, and that's not, so this behavior is, is ridiculous on the park's part. Um, I want this to be put on the agenda to be addressed more fully. Um, it, at, the, at your website, you indicate that there's this type of behavior going on, but it's very read between the lines. It should be fully disclosed to the public. If this is a policy being taken by the parks, this needs to be disclosed to the public whose parks it is, because I think you would find it's very unacceptable and most people would not agree with it. So I do understand the dilemma of the, the wildlife and the birds. I love them. I walk, I love that shoreline and I walk it every day, but I hardly ever see a cat there. So I'm not quite sure how this happened. And that's my comment. And I'm asking again to have this put on the next agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, your request is certainly considered. Do we have another um, public comment? We have a Renee Valencia on the call. Renee, could you please unmute? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh huh. Renata. Okay, uh, I have a comment that I'd like to read. My name is Renata Valencia. I live in El Cerrito and I'm a cat rescue in TNR, that's Trap Neuter Return Volunteer. I manage a colony of community cats in Richmond. I am commenting here about your policy allowing for the use of lethal removal of community cats from areas under your jurisdiction. 
I heard about this issue just the other day in this meeting only last night. So please forgive me if I'm in, I am not presenting information in the most organized or cogent way. That said, I feel I must stand up for the many community cats living outdoors through no fault of their own. The cats that those of us working in cat rescue and TNR care for by trapping and spaying or neutering, providing medical attention and feeding and caring for in the community during those times when it is not possible to move them to a home, backyard, or sanctuary. We are a community of volunteers working with local rescue organizations and public animal shelters to help minimize the number of community cats through TNR, finding them private homes or yards or sanctuaries whenever possible. And we also work to find homes for house cats dumped. And there is no other way to describe this other than these poor cats being dumped at our colonies and elsewhere, providing them with medical care and having them fixed if needed and rehoming them. In short, we work hard to get cats off the street and out of public places. My understanding is that in certain situations, the policy of the East Bay Regional Park District is to shoot feral cats, though we call them community cats. I believe the term your organization uses is lethal removal. In other words, killing, let's call it what it is. This issue came to light as the result of your organization killing community cats at the MLK Junior Shoreline in Oakland and elsewhere. The cats at MLK were shot even though the colony manager was working with a rescue organization and there were other resources available. I am asking you that you reverse this policy decision. It is a particular urgency that you do so now because of economic problems, pandemic related and otherwise, causing people to abandon their animals, resulting in an ever increasing number of homeless house cats. Just as some of the house cats your staff shot in Oakland were former house cats, the volunteer working with them could and would have gotten to safety. So there are and will be more that can be rescued and rehomed by volunteers working in the field. Also, using the issue of invasive versus native as justification for targeting certain animals for elimination is inhumane. A life is a life and suffering is suffering. There is evolution in where species wind up living. While it is often due to human carelessness or inhumanity, no matter. The solution cannot be to shoot whatever you choose to define as invasive. I'm not native to California nor to the entire US for that matter. No white person is. Should I be shot? There are better and humane ways of approaching the issue of community cats and reducing their numbers. Learning about the cat rescue in TNR communities and engaging in communication. Partnering with animal shelters and rescue organizations and working as part of a larger team. Helping educate others, particularly children. And speaking of children, what kind of message does shooting community cats send to children and others? Is there not enough animal cruelty? Not enough kittens thrown in boxes and left to die by the side of the road? Not enough cats shot with BB guns? Do you really want to add to this problem by sending the message that cats are of no worth? Why not serve as an example of the best we can be when it comes to all animals? It was hard for me to accept that an organization with your mission would be engaged in shooting community cats. Right now? Could you this is something that needs to be given a thorough public airing and that's how I plan to spend a significant amount of my time in the next couple of weeks ensuring that all East Bay communities know about your policy and action so they can weigh in. Thank you for your time. Yeah, I appreciate your coming and talking to us about it. Uh, do we have another uh, person who wants to talk to us live before we go to the emails? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, the name again? Yeah. And I'm not sure the last name is T. We can't hear you. Yeah, we can't hear you. Zach. Speak up. We have a Cecilia Theus. Yeah. Okay. Cecilia, go ahead. Uh, Cecilia? No. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, Coca, can you communicate with her a little better? Um, yeah. okay. okay, I'm so sorry for that. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can hear you now. And, and uh, you go ahead, you have three minutes. Uh, speaker. Okay. 
We could hear you. Oh, I know. Here we go. Mm. Okay, so now what do I do? We can hear you. Go ahead. We can hear you, so you should go ahead and, and speak. Oh, here we go. This is Cecilia Thies. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 So go ahead. You have three minutes. Hmm. I don't believe this happened. Oh, wow. Yeah, apparently she can't see hear us. Um. Oh. Well, can we can we chat? Okay, I'm just going to go on faith now. I can't hear you, but I'll just speak. Um, my name is Cecilia Thies. I was one of two people that was managing um, the colony that was shot. Um, I want um, to request that this go on agenda as soon as possible. And I also want to request an investigation um, that the public can also um, be told information like how many cats have been shot, uh, where, how many parks are shooting cats. I also want to um, have an investigation as to your staff and um, the lies that I personally received um, about what happened to the cats was a cruel thing to do. Uh, Tiffany and I were looking for cats for days when your staff um, at the same time was calling them. So um, I think the public has a lot more to say than I do personally, but I have a lot of information about each and every cat that was microchipped, that was fixed, that was fed, and that was loved. And I'm uh, an open book and willing to give any information. The cats were never fed on your parks. I was feeding them in a business park because I worked for Alameda County and the business park was too close to the park. I also want to say that had I ever been contacted and told that these animals were going to be killed, I would have been out there with tons of volunteers to get them out of harm's way. I don't know. Well, thank you for coming and speaking to us, Cecilia. You know, and I think you sent us also some messages. Um, so, Coca, do we have some other people who want to speak to us live? Back from Christina Tarr. Um, so I think that is all the people that are going to speak to us live. But we did get some written in comments that we can read out now. Oh, Coca, it looks like Christina may be available to speak live. She, she turned her camera on. Yeah, so I'm, I'm seeing here. No. Yes, I, I'm here. So, sorry, I was doing something else. Um, I would just like to say I'm, I'm a, absolutely a cat lover, but cats do not belong in a wildlife refuge. I, there's all this documentation that 30% of the birds in the, this country have died because they're because of, of human impact, which does include cats. I'm, you know, I'm totally a lover of cats, but cats do not belong in Martin Luther King Wildlife Refuge or other places where you've got endangered birds that are trying to be, to, to survive. So if they have to be shot, I'm very sorry, but they have to be shot. That, that's, I'm, I'm sad, but I'm totally in support of East Bay Regional Parks doing whatever they need to do. And that's really all I need to say, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for coming and speaking to us. Um, so I think with that, we will move to um, read uh, some of the um, messages that we have received uh, before the deadline yesterday. And I do want to say that, uh, that uh, the board is, has received all of these messages and we have a chance to read them entirely. So um, we are going to, but we're going to go through all the ones that that were received yesterday. Um, AGM Kelchner, did you wanna say something before we start reading these? Thank you, Director Lane. I actually will be reading them myself. So I'm, when you're ready, I'll go ahead and read them into the record. And as uh, Director Lane mentioned, um, we will be paraphrasing a bit uh, because there's a lot of repetition in the comments and we did receive a total of nine 
comments, I believe. So the first comment is from Dinah Hayes, and it reads as follows. The East Bay Regional Park District has failed terribly by shooting and killing the Oak Port Colony cats. There is, is, is a responsibility to act humanely towards animals, and you should have tried to identify and work with resources regarding cat colony management. This demonstrates a lack of the com compassion and problem solving skills by the park district and has se severely eroded trust in the park management and employees who carried out these actions. Please develop an official partnership with a rescue, shelter, or organization that can help with responsible colony management in a responsible, caring way rather than treating animals like trash to be disposed of. The second column, uh, comment that we have is from Quinn White. And it reads, in regards to the park district shooting cats, our parks and many other public resources need more funding. If they did have more funding, this would not have happened. I agree that fragile ecosystems can be irreparably harmed by cats. I agree that cats are common compared to indicator species like the clapper rail cited in the recent ABC News article about the shootings. However, as someone with a Master of Science in Environmental Management who works in animal welfare, I believe there is a big cultural divide between environmental scientists and the animal welfare activists, in part because scientists don't talk to their communities. In this specific instance, public signage could have helped. Reaching out to the city shelter could have helped. Instead, rangers shot cats in secret, and officials admit they didn't try to communicate about it beforehand. I hope the realization that cats are prowling in parks can be seen as an opportunity to educate the public on the harms of cats to wildlife and to find allies that can help relocate feral cats. Please consider reaching out to the community as a first step. The next comment is from Kathy Nyland. I am a frequent user of the Park District Public Hiking Trails. I am also a former employee of the Oakland Base to Rescue Cat Town and have participated in other re animal rescue volunteer work and cat trapping. Though it should come as no surprise to you that I was horrified to learn of the actions by park district employees in the inhumane animal control of free roaming cats in the parks. Do you think that it is acceptable to shoot and kill outdoor cats, a pet known to roam is unacceptable. I find it very hard to believe that park employees would not know about the resources available to them. Oakland is full of feral stray cats and there are organizations who work humanely to trap, fix, and rehome these cats. I am sympathetic to the frustrations of wildlife preservationists who have to contend with cats, but this is unacceptable. Comment from Andrew Dorman. I am an animal welfare professional and have worked on animal welfare and rescue issues in Oakland for more than seven years. I urge the district to immediately and permanently end the practice of killing cats on district property. As you may know, cats roam and this practice endangers pet cats owned by the public who are lawfully permitted to be outdoors. Feral cats in managed colonies have caretakers who bond with the animals. Like other animals with large litters of offspring, cat populations will naturally increase to a level that can be sustained by the available food source. Killing some cats is not a long-term solution. National organizations recommend trap, neuter, and return as the most effective and humane method to manage feral cat populations. In sensitive habitats such as the MLK shoreline, cats can be trapped and relocated in cooperation with local shelters and rescues. And finally, most importantly, cats are domestic animals and should not be subject to killing being, by being shot or poisoned. The next comment is by Trish Rope. I was appalled to learn of your current practice of shooting to kill feral abandoned cats as a means of saving birds and other wildlife. While I agree that protecting wildlife is essential, I disagree with this inhumane practice as I know there are humane ways of controlling unwanted feral cats. Look to the Project Bay Cat for an example of, community, of a community coming together to reduce the feral cat population humanely while saving the birds and other wildlife along the Foster City Levee. Levy. From the recent ABC 7 News report, from which I learned of this practice, it appears the regional parks now has offers of help from several humane organizations, including Oakland Animal Services, where I am a volunteer. 
I am asking this board to pledge to discontinue this inhumane practice of shooting feral and abandoned cats and adhere to your own values. Not pledging to discontinue this practice will be cause for me to rethink my annual financial support of the Regional Parks Foundation. The next comment is from Linda Rogers. I am commenting on the recent investigative report published by local ABC Channel 7 News. They exposed a common practice and policy at the park district that sanctions and supports the violent eradication of abandoned community cats by gunshot if found on or near park district properties. This policy is archaic and the time for its removal is long past. Just because these cats were abandoned then formed a close family knit colony near an area where some endangered, where some endangered birds may nest does not give the park district permission to intentionally avoid all humane management paths open to them and default to the path that enables some trigger happy staff to line the cats up at their trusted and safe feeding stations and execute them in front of each other. There are ample cat rescue nonprofit groups in all the counties where the park district owns land who are ready to help humanely trap and relocate the cats. Your choice to continue this policy will make global headlines. But for now, this East Bay community is watching your every move uh, of it, relative to the adoption of humane management of abandoned community cats found in and around your lands. And we have three more. The next one is from Mary O'Malley. In light of the recent news coverage regarding the park district's pra practice of shooting cats found on park district lands, I would like to submit comments to the committee. I'm strongly opposed to shooting and killing cats on Park District land. I personally walk along MLK Junior shoreline regularly, as well as many other Park District parks. It is disturbing to me that park employees may be firing live ammunition, ammunition in places designed for people's recreation. Furthermore, killing cats, feral or friendly, is inhumane. I cannot come to, as a surprise to you that shooting and killing cats would bring public outrage. Prior to instituting such a practice, the Park District should have notified the public. While this committee meeting is not the form to submit requests, I would very much appreciate it if the Park District would answer the following question. And five questions are listed here asking for specific facts uh, that the staff can respond to separately. And the next comment is from Kathy Agnon. I am commenting on the recent investigative report published by local ABC Ch Channel 7 News. They exposed a common practice, and the remainder of the um, comment is the same as the comment that I just read. So just to finish that one, your choice to continue this policy will make global headlines. The next comment is, um, let's see, Angela Gonzalez. I think I missed that one. Uh, she starts with a quote from Proverbs 12.10. Whoever has regard for the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. And the rest of the uh, comment is the same as the previous comment. And that concludes all of the comments that we received from the public. And I would just like to repeat what Director Elaine had said, that the board has received copies of all of these comments in full and uh, for their full consideration. All right, thank you very much for reading those and for people who came and spoke to us. Um, you know, as um, we indicated, this item is not on the agenda for the meeting, and so we can't have a detailed discussion of it. But I certainly want to acknowledge the community's concern regarding the removal of feral cats from the habitat at Martin Luther King Regional Shoreline. Now, this is always an emotional and, and challenging situation for us. Um, and I think that some of the communication that uh, came out and was reported was not entirely accurate because efforts were indeed made to contact people involved in taking care of these cats. We appreciate animal life, but it is required by law for us to protect threatened and endangered wildlife living in the park district. And Martin Luther King shoreline is a sensitive ecological area with hundreds of bird species who come through on the Pacific Flyway and who live there, such as the Ridgeways rail, black rail, salt marsh harvest uh, mouse, and the burring owl. So um, as a couple of you mentioned, we have been contacted by 
people who take care of cats, uh, concerned cat groups. Um, and so we hope that um, out of what has happened, we can begin to address a new way to make sure these cats are um, being removed safely uh, from the habitat, which we are required to protect. So um, with that, I will say, um, it certainly has been an eye-opening day with our agendas and with the people speaking to us. And um, I appreciate your attending. So thank you for that. And are there any additional board comments uh, that anyone would like to make before we adjourn? Yes, Elizabeth. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I, I also want to thank everyone for coming and expressing their views. And I am very sorry to hear about what happened. And I do think there are opportunities to work with local cat and animal organizations and volunteers to, to notify and hopefully to, um, to, as others have said, to spay and neuter and, and rehome these animals. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I do believe the staff made some efforts, but I think there's certainly, we can do a lot more. And so I certainly look forward to working with you folks and, and our staff on, on, on going forward. Thank you. Colin? Yeah, I want to express appreciation for all the work that was put into the presentations today. You were all very helpful and interesting. So I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I agree with uh, Elizabeth that, do you need something? Coco? Well, why, why don't you finish and then I'll just... She was okay. waving at me, I thought. <laughs> no? Anyway, I um, appreciate what I heard from the audience and all the emails uh, that we received. I uh, tend to agree with Elizabeth there is a lot of ingenuity in uh, our management and our park staff that can work with these uh, animal services organizations, both governmental and non-governmental, to uh, come to a, a better solution for this. Hopefully, that will come quickly. Thank you. Thank you. And then, Coca, did you have something to add? Uh, I just wanted to point out that there are actually two other written-in comments that are on topics unrelated. Oh, that's uh, right. So do you want to read those for us? I can read those out. Okay. Uh, so the first is from Alex Ruber. He says, I would love to hear if there are plans to protect our lakes from becoming wasteland in a place where people gather to openly drink alcohol and smoke or vape. I'm no longer able to take my kids to Lake Chabot, for example, as there are always crowds that smoke, vape, drink liquor, and just use profanity. Once recently, I would witness a fight break out. I cannot even take my children to clean the shorelines as I am concerned for their safety and exposure to this kind of behavior. See pictures attached, um, which obviously you cannot see. Um, but he said he tried to fish at Raccoon Point at Lake Chabot. And well, thank you. We did see those pictures. Okay, and one other item? Yes, and one other from Betty Davis. Uh, she says, COVID-19 at Point Isabel Dog Park. Last time there was a lockdown, um, I noticed some people did not carry the doggy poop bags. The longtime patrons for the most part did. In hopes of avoiding a problem and loose use of the park, I was wondering if the trash receptacle from Richmond Sanitary Service could be placed at the curb in each of the parking lots. I believe people will use them. That way it would not require staff to empty the cans and Richmond Sanitary Park could pick them up. No one would need to touch the cans. Please consider this. It would be much less expensive than having employees emptying the cans and the park will stay clean. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for reminding us that we had two additional ones. All right, so uh, this does conclude our, our meeting and uh, this is our last one for the year. So I want to... Um, Thank both of you for being on the committee with me this year. It's been a very interesting um, ride in a lot of ways. And um, it is a committee that I think deals with a lot of new information for us. And, and uh, I want to thank Matt, and our, uh, Mr. Growl, and, and uh, AGM Kelchner for managing the agenda this year. Uh, as we have gone through a number of fascinating topics. 
So again, thank you all for coming and we are now